Hello, everybody. Welcome to my shop. Glad to see everybody on this Thursday, what is it, early evening? Kind of sort of early evening. Just adjust that real quick. And just like this backlight. Um, so, as I said, those of you on my email list got an email from me uh, like, earlier this week. Basically saying, hey, let's do another one of these live things because they're kind of fun. And uh, that's what this is. Again, it's, uh, I'm calling it Ruin A because I've been at work all day, like many of you. Some of you are probably still at work. And it's 98 degrees and about 60 degrees of humidity outside. And running around the lumber yard all day. I need a beer. Not that I recommend beer and woodworking. If I do any serious woodworking, trust me, I'll be setting that aside. So, uh, typical format. Uh, open Q&A. Uh, if anybody has questions, fire them up in the chat room. I love it if you can put them in all caps because it just makes it so much easier for me to keep track of them. Please ask questions. If I miss your question, uh, feel free. I'll try to go in order as best as possible. Feel free to restate. You're not annoying me unless you act annoying and then clear that. So, um, wow, we already have a question. Hey, Finn. Nice to see you again, buddy. Um, let me go... Here, well, real quick, um, out of order here. This is the, the blanket test. I've had several people who have uh, asked just for kind of update on the blanket test. It is done. Um, in fact, I need to go ahead and move the drawers out of the, out of the way of the bench. I've just been taking them out while everything kind of airs out. I put paste wax on them while the paste wax is dry and everything. But this is the infamous blanket chest that I've been working on for, it's been almost two years. Just so many things have gotten in the way of finishing this, and I'll admit there was a fair amount of my way that just got sick of this project, and I kept finding lots of other little things to do while I was working on it. So there's no reason it took that long, but yes, the entire thing was built by hand. Um, see my shop, you know, the only power tool I have is a planer, um, <laughs> but everything else, uh, everything was done by hand. I did skim the top once with my uh, my uh, fitness planner, but other than that, everything else was done entirely by hand. It's got um, four coats of general finishes and Durabar on it, and 
I'm kind of curious. Uh, I got some um, some feedback. I don't remember where it was. One of the social media channels. People were surprised that I finished the inside. And I know traditionally there's a lot of people who talk about not finishing the inside. Even James Craft talked about not finishing the inside of the chest. And certainly, when you put an oil finish on here, it takes for flip and ever to dry out. And if you're ever going to put clothing, I mean, this is a blanket chest. I don't know if I put blankets in or not, but that um, those 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 fabrics can pick up that, that smell. And really, you should let that finish cure for like 30 some days. And I use a water based finish, and Durabar is water based, but it still is a varnish, and I do really want this to cure a long time. The way I figured it's taking so flipping long to build it, it's not going to hurt to have it sit around curing in one of my extra rooms um, for you know, 30 days or so. But I really didn't want to leave the inside unfinished. As you can see, the figure on the front is just ridiculous. That same figure translates into the inside of the case. And there's a cool strip of sapphire on the inside. Um, there's a nice frame and panel interior. The underside of this rift saw cherry looks beautiful. There's this cool park inclusion here. I, just, I wanted that figure to pop. So, um, plus, because it's such a wide open piece, I'm not really worried about um, leaving a little and just letting it air out. So, there certainly will be um, varying opinions on whether or not you finish the inside of the case or not. You know, you can always use shellac. Shellac is really good at you know, certainly quickly drying, but also not really having to worry about off-gassing that much because it is a natural product, just bound by boring and alcohol, it's really not an issue. But finishes today, um, the low BOC nature of some of these finishes, I'm really uh, very comfortable finishing the inside of the case. So in case anybody was wondering how come I chose to finish it, that's because it's just so bloody pretty on the inside. So anyway. That's the update on the case. Again, this is a project from Hansel School Semester 6. Um, it is currently, what, 11 chapters long? Um, oh, I don't know the total footage. Probably four or five hours of footage on building this whole thing. So um, it was an undertaking. It's very comprehensively covered. Um, then getting the last couple of videos edited and up on the Hansel School site um, building it soon. I'll also be offering this build as a standalone product. You don't just have to get it through semester six, but I probably won't be making that for sale individually for a little while yet. I've got some other stuff that needs to be done before I go that direction. So anyway, that that is the blank chest just to answer people's questions about uh, what, what's the story on it. Um, now, as far as other questions, Let me check my sound here. Hmm. Bear with me a second, guys. One minute, folks. I don't know why this is doing this. I'm gonna try this again. change my system preferences. It looks like some of these settings got changed and I didn't realize that. Sorry about this. Okay. Let's see if that makes a difference. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it switched over to default on us. Okay. 
that. That did it. Okay. Whew. Sorry about that, guys. Ah. One of the things with the broadcast software I use is there doesn't seem to be a way to save any defaults, which is really frustrating. And as I plugged in, you guys may notice I've got a third camera running now, so Lord knows. Anyway, um, it's also what happens when I take the Bluetooth headphones out that's monitoring my sound. I guess I should probably keep them in, but then I have to hear myself play 10 seconds back, which is just not good. So anyway, guys, sorry about that. Um, if it gets bad again, do something, <laughs> just like you did before. Wow, lots of people did before. Okay, so we're gonna go back up to the top here. Finn wants to know what screwdrivers do I use? Um, and I think you asked that question last time, Finn, and I never, I never saw it until the end, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm not sure whether you're looking for the brand or just types of screwdrivers. I use standard Phillips head and Roberts drive or square drive. Um, the ones that I like to use the most are the um, Elkhead Tools screwdrivers. In fact, here they are. They are really, really nice screwdrivers, but obviously they are really super Gucci screwdrivers. So it's one of those things, they've got cocable handles. This is a mesquite handle. This is a, a small uh, standard or slot head. This is the a number two slot head, number one slot head, and a number two Phillips. But the rest of the time, I'm using one of these multi-bit driver dealies because I feel like lately, I've certainly been using a fair amount of, of Roberts or square drive screws um, around the shop. Not really in my project. When it comes to the projects, I'm pretty much using a standard slot screwdriver. But um, there's always times when I've got like weird deck screws or something and I need star drive bits. I actually have a, a lathe project kit that has one of these things with, that you can, you know, multi-driver type things that I need to get around to turning. I've got a cool piece of snake wood I think I'll use for it. But those are the, those are the drivers that I use. Um, nothing super, super special, but other than the fact that the gorgeous Elkhead, uh, Elkhead tool screwdrivers are in there. Um, I wrote about them on my blog a while ago um, in the interest of full disclosure. Two of those screwdrivers were sent to me to, to demo. I did not pay for them. The third one, the small mesquite handle one, I, I bought that because I was just so happy with them that I wanted another one. Um, don't ask me how much they cost, I have no idea. It, I've had the one that I just bought, I think I bought it two years ago. <laughs> Couldn't tell you what, what I paid for it at the time. Uh, moving along here. It sounds like we're at the beach, I like that. Uh, thank you, DOA Dylan, I'm really happy with that. Whoa, my chat room just jumped up. Uh, Gary wants to know, how would you make a scroll board molding like in a period piece? Are you talking about fretwork, Gary? Um, scroll board molding. So um, like lots of negative space cut out fretwork, right? As you would see in, in Chippendale furniture and chinoiserie type furniture. I would use my bird's mouth. My, it's funny that you use the word scroll board because this is my scroll board. I'm gonna move my beer because I know I'm just gonna knock it. And then people can say, what finishes on your workbench? It's, it's a nice Hefeweizen. That's what's on my workbench, a fine Hefeweizen. So this is most traditionally known as a bird's mouth fixture. This was a project I made for the hand tool school, um, specifically to talk about refining curves. The, the curve work and everything on here was all done uh, in, in a lesson. But um, I've used this on uh, the Renaissance Woodworker a couple of times to, uh, let's see, I made that little scroll saw reindeer. Um, this fancy fly swatter, which actually has been really useful because I had a whole bunch of flies in my shop recently. All the scroll or fret work was done on this thing. So first things first, and you know what? I've got, I've got some designs for a relatively simple um, wall shelf, a Chippendale style wall shelf that would, could be built with like a single, probably uh, one by six piece of mahogany or, or, or whatever species you want um, that has a lot of that fretwork uh, detail on it. Uh, and I should probably get around to building that. But I would use a fret saw for that. Um, 
I have two of them, both new concept saws that I've picked up over the years, which, uh, by the way, I know I've, I've said this already publicly, but um, rest in peace, Lee Marshall. The, that's the gentleman that, uh, that came up with this saw design. Uh, he recently died from cancer, which was really sad to hear that. Um, this one in particular I like because of the really deep throat, and I can come in and saw in and around like crazy on this. Um, if you can't see the top profile of this, there is a big V in the top of it and a center hole. So you can kind of rotate all of your work around it. Get a little bit closer here with another camera. All the work is done vertically because you can rely on gravity. Now, I use my fret saws normally on the push stroke. I switch the blade around to the pull stroke, which I think this one is still set up that way. Yes, it is. Um, so let's grab a board, a thin one preferably. Eh, nothing super big, but this, you set the work on top, you run the saw in vertically, and I've actually taken a Sharpie line across the, the base of this to allow me to set it at a height that works well for me. And what this allows me to do, set the board down, and I turn the piece just like you would on a power scroll saw. And this allows me to really focus on keeping the saw vertical because I'm working with gravity here. And you can make cool little pieces like that. So as far as how I would make it, it would start with a pattern and I would lay out that pattern on whatever the board would be. And then I would just come in and cut it out. In many instances, there's gonna be, well not most fret work you're gonna look at is going to be captive designs. So you're gonna have like a little hole like we've got you know, already drilled in here, I would take the saw blade out, feed it through that hole, and then cut out those center sections. That's actually the most difficult part of fret work. It's not the actual sawing. It's all the time required to loosen the blade, take it out, thread it through a hole, tighten it back up again, and do the sawing. Um, the key with, with any turning saw, whether it's a, a bigger turning saw or a small delicate fret saw, is to always be making your turns while you're on the cut stroke. And this is a particularly fine tooth blade. Um, shoot. The blade is a 28 tooth per inch, two watt blade is an Olsen scroll saw blade. And it just does fantastic work. The, the cleanliness of that cut, it's practically shiny already. So the goal is to make that cut as clean as possible so you don't have to do a bunch of, of refinement. To refine it, I'm gonna use a series of rasps. Uh, rat tail rasps can be really good for getting into the really small areas. I also have a very fine Leoge rasp, but it's a half round rasp that is, is tiny. And uh, what is it, a 15 grain? I think that's the finest they make now. That can really get inside there and you can use the flat face or the curved face. That's how I would go about cleaning that up. Um, I do have a couple of riffler files that can take the surface even finer. But you'll notice if you look at actual period reproductions, the cleanliness of that cut is actually not all that clean. And nine times out of 10, they will also, often also back bevel that cut. Because what you wanna see is the silhouette of the fret work, not the actual thickness of the board. So if you angle the cut back a little bit, what you get is that leading edge in stark relief and you don't, you can't actually see the thickness through. At the same time, they're often um, very small and delicate. They're often set up along the crown of a piece. So they're kind of, they're meant to be seen at a bit of an angle and they often have, at least in the, the antique ones I've seen, lots of furniture, or excuse me, lots of finish, lots of dirt, grime, possibly furniture polish on top of it to kind of um, disguise the, um, the possible ragged nature of the saw cut. But again, if you're using a delicate fret saw, the, I mean, this, this wood is actually shiny. The cut is so fine. Um, so yeah, 
That's how I would go about making fretwork. I hope I was talking about the right thing, Gary. <laughs> and I'm so glad to hear that uh, the uh, sound is better. What wood screws do I use? Good follow-up question, Christian. Um, hey, Christian, nice to see you, by the way. Um, nice to see everybody, but Christian's one of my apprentices, so it's always nice to see one of you guys. You guys are special. Um, wood screws. Uh, I use a bunch of different kinds. Um, on a piece like, like the blanket chest, I try to be as traditional as possible and use only uh, slot head screws um, and obviously screws that will match the hardware. I use an antique brass, so I've got an antique brass screw. Now those screws are provided by any good hardware company. In that case, it was Horton Brasses and they gave me uh, the brass screws. Brass screws can be a little bit soft, so Horton actually gives you a steel screw as well to kind of pre-thread the holes. Um, that's about it on, quote, finer furniture, but on um, other stuff like workbenches and shop stuff, I use a lot of self-tapping Roberts Drive screws. Um, colloquially, probably the best, best known as pocket hole screws. Um, these guys. Uh, I've got a bunch of them floating around here. These happen to be stainless steel, um, what, two and a half inch screws. And uh, they've got, again, the square or Roberts Drive head. They've got the self-tapping threads at the bottom. They're very aggressive. Um, very nice because usually when I'm using a screw like that, it's in some sort of shop related piece and I can get away without really pre-drilling very much, which is nice. Um, I also use for finer work, where I don't really want the, the screw head to be totally obvious. I have some, which I, I would really call deck screws. They have a fine head on them. And again, they have a, actually kind of like a birdcage all pyramidal point and self-tapping threads at the bottom and it has a star drive head. Really strong screw. Here's a similar one with the, the bugle top head, but again, self-tapping, this is stainless steel and it's got the star drive head. That's what I use most often when like my bench hooks and things that have a cleat screwed onto the bottom, that's what I'm using. Occasionally, and I find these are really good for drawer pulls. If you have like a wooden drawer pull and you need an actual screw, I'll use these pan head guys. So they've got that big washer pan head on them. This is actually self-tapping kind of sort of as well. It's not nearly as efficient as the other ones. But again, that's a traditional Phillips head on it. Um, that's really it. Uh, I kind of gave up on using big box store screws a while ago because I had so many problems with them kind of snapping and breaking. But every now and then I still kind of pull them out and use them. But I tend to buy my screws now from like Rockler or um, McFeely's. Buy them online because I don't, I don't have a Rockler near me or, or even a Woodcraft near me. So yeah, those are the kind of screws I use. <laughs> Andrew wants to know what the recommended blood alcohol content for hand tool woodworking. It is zero. Officially, it is zero. Depends on the work you're trying to do, I suppose. But no, I don't condemn alcohol in woodworking. He says as he takes a sip of beer. Uh, okay, moving on. What is the work OOD to work with? And what's your favorite wood? Oh, OOD, object oriented design. Well, I prefer when I encapsulate my code to pay strict attention to the rules of inheritance. Sorry guys, I'm not a programmer. That's about all I know about object oriented designs. So if there are programmers in the room, you can call my bluff. That's all I know. Um, what is the worst wood to work with and what's your favorite, I think is what Finn is saying there. Come on, Finn, you speak English. You just can't type it apparently. The worst wood to work with and my favorite. Man, choosing a favorite wood is like choosing a favorite kid. Probably walnut um, as a cabinet making kind of furniture wood, um, American black walnut is just a joy. And again, I'm thinking from the t perspective of, of hand tools. Uh, black walnut is just lovely, lovely stuff. Um, Alaskan yellow cedar, oh my God. It, well, Hinoki um, cypress would be wonderful, but Alaskan yellow cedar is even better. Um, as a softwood, absolutely love it. Great, great um, growth, tight growth rings, cuts like butter. Um, 
Hornbeam, that's another one that I love. Much, 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 much harder, but it's so dense and homogenous that um, it, it doesn't really, you don't have kind of tearing problems or anything like that. If you ever work with a fruit wood, like an apple or pear, um, especially European or Swiss pear, it's very similar. Um, and it's, and it's a, it, at least for me, it's a, it's a native, uh, native tree to North America, but that's kind of hard to get. Um, turning, olive wood. When I turn, I love olive wood. It turns so beautifully well and it smells like I just stuck my head in a jar of olives or if you're feeling more cosmopolitan, uh, you just had a martini. So fantastic stuff. Worst wood to work with. Man, there's a lot of them that I could come up with. Um, is Robert Sphere in the room here? If he is, I'm sorry, Robert. Paduke. Hate it. Hate the stuff. Um, I don't like the look of it. I don't like how how incredibly garishly orange it is when it's freshly cut, and I don't how it turns, don't like how it turns kind of this muddy reddish orange color as it oxidizes. Um, it's a little brittle, at the same time interlocked and tears out a lot. Uh, the dust, even with hand tools, the dust bleeds into everything and turns everything else pink. Just don't like it. Don't like it aesthetically, don't like it technically and, and, and how it actually works. Um, man. There's got to be others. There's lots of woods that I hate working with. Um, but I don't work with them, so that's why I can't think of them. You know, I've, in, in nine times out of ten, I've worked with a lot of really crazy exotics, but I work with them in smaller pieces on the lathe. So that doesn't really count. I mean, because the, when you've got a really crazy grain wood, the best way to tackle it is go across the grain. And that's all we do on a lathe is work across the grain. You know, we may fool a little bit by skewing the tool or using a skew chisel, but for the most part, we're working across the grain. Um, certainly genuine mahogany is fantastic to work with. The mahogany likes African mahogany, this, the Kaya species, not a lot of fun to work with. Um, Kaya senegalensis, Kaya ivorensis, in other words from Senegal or the Ivy Coast, are really great woods to work with. But nine times out of ten, uh, and I just talked about this on Wood Talk recently, nine times out of ten you're going to get, even though it says African mahogany on the shelf, you're going to get like ten different species and you'll end up with Kaya and the teca, which, you know, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even turn that stuff into firewood. It's not worthy of firewood. It's just terrible, 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 uh, light pink, low density, completely interlocked crap. Um, and probably from some sort of war torn country. So it, it's, it's probably unethical at the same time. Um, we at the lumberyard where I work, we try to bring in nothing but Ivory Coast and Senegal stuff. Um, but even then, and the funny thing is, is the, the, Kai Ivorensis is not coming from the Ivory Coast anymore. Um, actually, neither is the Senegalensis. It's all coming from different areas, but um, they are much similar to something like a Sapili or a Udali. Um, as far as worst woods to work, you know, yeah, I'm going to stick with Badoo because even the really, really crazy, like, um, exotic stuff, like Burbinga, it's not that bad to work with, and it's gorgeous. Um, Sapili, love to work with. It can be a little bit difficult. Some of the really, really weird stuff like I mentioned snake wood earlier I mean it's incredibly brittle but it's just a matter of adjusting how you work with it and if it's beautiful enough I'll deal with the pain of the technical properties being really really difficult come on Finn 2 12 a.m. if you're dyslexic it means you can't read right are you dysgraphic too I'm really not making fun of, of, of that please don't take that the wrong way uh, need to know where to get center point drill bits. Um, Tim, I, I see your question. I won't forget it. Um, center point drill bits, uh, honestly, eBay, um, flea markets have been the best resource. There's lots of things on eBay and, and various flea markets and stuff that you end up buying like a box of bits. You'll buy like 20 bits in order to get two center bits, but generally it's like five bucks too. Um, the Brown Tool Auction is a fantastic place to go. JJ Donnelly. Um, auctions is another good one to go. You can also always talk to Josh Clark at HyperKitten. He's pretty resourceful about finding that stuff. I found all mine through eBay, buying a whole bunch of bits and kind of pulling them together to, um, to get that. Oh, Gary, I didn't answer your question right, did I? Making a molding like crown molding it has to follow the curve of the scroll board. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, Gary, I would call that like gooseneck molding. That all comes down to carving gouges and scratch stocks. The scratch stock, gotta have a scratch stock. So 
what you're going to have to do is certainly saw out the, the overall shape and then you're going to have to carve um, with, a, with a carving gouge a, a big, um, as wide as you can, try to match the sweep as much as you can, hog out as much of that material as possible with the carving gouge. Then you need to create a scratch stock that, that matches that profile. What am I doing? Scratch stocks. Um, scratch stocks are stupid simple. They can be a single block like this. This happens to be a bead scratch stock. If you look real close there, you can see it's just a little 3 16 inch bead. Um, this is, has a threaded, one of these threaded insert things right in the end of the block. This, by the way, this is marble wood. This is kind of a pain in the butt to work with. Um, this guy threads in through an insert and it just pinches the bit of steel. And this is uh, an old piece of uh, card scraper, actually, and it just pinches it in the kerf. That's a real simple one. You just ride, this is your fence, you ride it against the edge and you create that bead. This is a little bit more detailed one. And I said earlier I wasn't using big box screws. Well, look, there's big box screws. Uh, this happens to just be kind of a thumbnail profile. It's a relatively simple profile. But you'll notice this edge here. See how it's curved? It's kind of, I would make it even more curved. But that, what that allows you to do is ride on that kind of single point and work um, along a curvature. And you can create really complex profiles. Let me see if I can pull one out here and the more complex ones that I've done. I need to create some sort of holder for all my scratch stocks. Uh huh, that's not the one I was looking for, but that'll work. Here's another scratch stock that I created. This one's kind of fun. It's two fences. And this profile is, whoa, it's kind of a bull nose profile. You take your board, and you slide your fences in to match that board, and you can scrape the edge of the board with it. I was using this specifically for this profile. This is a rule joint profile for a drop leaf table. This cuts the female part of the joint and this cuts the male part of the joint. Slots in here and again, I'm shaping those with gouges. In this case, it was a straight line. I was using planes for the most part and then um, unifying that shape using the scratch stock. So you do the same thing with a curved gooseneck molding, um, but you've got to spend some time with those carving gouges. And you know, if the word carving freaks you out, don't, don't let it. Um, because so much of it is just um, hacking stuff out to a line with a gouge and the real work happens with the scratch stock. Um, talk a bit about clamps and clamping. Um, sure. Um, this chat room keeps jumping up every time somebody adds to it. Um, I am, <laughs> I'm probably the worst person to ask about clamps and clamping because I'm kind of weird about clamps. I, I am not one that believes you can never have too many clamps. Um, I'm a big fan of drawboard joints, so where the peg is doing all the actual clamping work. Um, I, I also, because of the way I work, I don't end up with large amounts of, of huge glue-ups. Glue I break things down into sub-assemblies a lot. So I rarely find myself in a situation where I've run out of clamps. Now, I have a fair amount now. Um, here, let's go to the wide angle here and pivot over there a little. This is my clamp rack. Um, I've got some of these Rockler F-style clamps in 12 inches. What are there's, uh, what, six of those 12 inches. I've got four 24 inches. I've got some uh, uh, Jorgensen 24 inches. And then these jet parallel clamps do the bulk of my work. A um, couple 24s, some 33s, a couple 48s, and then, yeah, 48s are as long as I go. I've got one Jorgensen clamp that's actually up at the front of the shop somewhere that is like 50 some inches long. I don't even remember why I have that. Um, but what I use a lot of actually are these cheapo Irwin quick clamps. I've got them scattered all over the shop. Um, I've got mostly in this, like, what is that size? Like an eight inch size. I've got some more over there um, just beyond my, my post drill. They're kind of scattered all over the place because I find them to be really, really beneficial in clamping up 
small parts and stuff. Um, so I've been known to use like a rope clamp, like a windlass, when I needed to clamp together that four poster bed that I made recently. There's a video on my channel about that. Uh, I, I'm just not a, I'm not a guy that is going out and buying huge amounts of clamps. I used bar clamps for a while. In fact, there's a couple down in the corner there that are, are very covered in dust because my parallel clamps have kind of replaced them. Bar clamps are perfectly fine. Um, I happen to like the parallel clamps because they're just a lot more stable. They do a better job of, of keeping the board flat. Um, they don't flex as much because they're that I-beam construction. That's definitely my favorite clamp, but those are what I use for like gluing up larger carcasses, occasionally a panel. Um, if you guys have seen the video I did on the panel clamps, um, these guys, these are fantastic for gluing up, especially uh, like more than two board panels. Um, but again, they have to be, all those boards have to be, you know, the identical thickness. And this is a clamp that I would use to really get my seam, my glue lines perfectly flat. A lot of times the way I work because of the, the hand tool approach, I will often join together two boards with rough faces. All I've done is joint the edge, glue them together, and then I'll surface it all as one board. Rather than surfacing each board individually, gluing it together, and then going back and surfacing it all over again, I find, you know what, just glue it together and surface it that way. When I do that though, this panel clamp doesn't work because the boards might be of uneven thickness and this relies upon them all being the same thickness. Um, I do have a couple of the wooden screw clamps, which now are sitting behind my panel clamp. Um, this big guy and a couple smaller ones, honestly, I rarely use this for like glue up clamping, but I use it for work holding clamping putting it down on the bench, clamping something, and then grabbing a hold fast and clamping the clamp to the bench. That can be really good for edge work. Um, as far as clamping, using them, the number one thing I can tell you about clamping or any assembly or glue up is to take your time to rehearse. Do the dry fit, not just the dry fit, but Figure out exactly what clamps you're going to use and where. Stage the clamps exactly where they need to go. Stage the parts so they all need to go. Um, so that when it comes time and you've got the glue out and the glue's painted on and things are curing, you just, there's no guessing where I'm going to put stuff. It's just put it all together and really do that dry fit like two and three times. That's why I say rehearse it. Um, so that in the heat of the moment, you're not screwing stuff up. But yeah, I'm... I'm weird in a lot of ways because I just don't use that many clamps. Um, I haven't run into a situation yet where I needed to, uh, needed to know. I needed like 20 more clamps or even, you know, a couple extra clamps. It's just a matter of breaking it down into sub-assemblies. Uh, real quick, what song was playing at the beginning? That's uh, called Cut Against the Grain by Underhill Rose. Um, yes, that Underhill. It's Roy's uh, youngest daughter, Eleanor, and um, her, uh, uh, her two bandmates. They are um, bluegrass band. They did a Kickstarter campaign a while ago for their second album, and I supported them at, a, I think it was the $500 level, which got me a custom song. So I had them write a song for me, um, Cut Against the Grain. It's the Renaissance Way. Good song. Uh, it's on my blog a couple places if you're ever interested in hearing the whole thing. Um, I found a Bailey number no. four in an antique shop for 45 bucks in pristine condition. Should I use it or save it? Use it. Absolutely, use it. Um, if you mean save it, like hanging on the wall, then I'm just not gonna talk to you anymore. Use that thing. There's nothing special, at least as far as I know, unless there's some kind of weird thing, like it's got a poster stamp stuck to it with an upside down biplane on it. Uh, there's nothing particularly collectible about that. Correct me if I'm wrong. If anybody thinks there's something super collectible about it, I'm not the guy to ask about collectible stuff. I am a tool user. So I say use that thing, especially if it's in pristine condition. The only thing I worry about about a plane in pristine condition is something may be wrong with it. There's a reason nobody ever used it. Then again, there were so many number fours made that there's probably a lot of them that sat on shelves their entire lives and never got um, picked up. What do I have in my apron pockets? Have I answered this before? I may have. Uh, I've got two six inch rulers. Um, not sure why I have two. Um, this one I got first and it has this little lip on the end that allows you to press it against something. It's kind of nice, but it also kind of gets in the way because in order to attach that lip, this is a Woodcraft ruler. It's got this little 
screwed piece on there. So you can't lay it flat on something, which is why I have this little six inch. This is it's funny, actually. Um, my mother-in-law gave this to me for like my 30th birthday, I think. This is a Bridge City Tool ruler. I can't imagine what she paid for this thing. Uh, talk about excess. This is the only Bridge City Tool I have. Great company, but man, their stuff's expensive. You're talking to a guy who's got Veritas and Lee Nielsen stuff, and I think it's expensive. Um, I've got a pencil. I've got a fine point Sharpie. And honestly, the reason I have a fine point Sharpie is because I do so much filming, and I find that the fine point Sharpie shows up on camera better than a pencil line. That's the primary reason that's there. This little pocket over here is actually perfect for when the pencil gets short, which is right about now. I've got a microphone. I have a remote control for my camera. This is awesome. It's a little solid brass pencil sharpener. It's got a small hole on it and a big hole for bigger, fatter pencils, like the official Renaissance Woodworker pencils. Love this thing. Even though I have a, a regular like wall-mounted elementary school pencil sharpener, this is just in my apron pocket. Love keeping it around. Um, in the other pocket, I have a remote control for an LED light panel. Can you tell I do a lot of filming? I have a lumber crayon. And I have two blocks of wood. This block of wood happens to be covered with lumber crayon. This is what I use to check the set on a plane. When I first pull the plane out and am checking to make sure that the blade is aligned, I'll advance the blade by sighting down it and I'll use the lateral adjuster back here to see, is it, is it straight? And then I'll run the, the block down the face and you can feel the resistance, you can feel is that blade equal? And that's really all that little guy is for. This extra little block of wood is used for the same purpose. And for some reason, I just ended up with two of them in my, my apron pockets. And right now, that's it. Um, my apron will fill up with stuff as I'm working on things. Occasionally, there'll be a screwdriver in that pocket or something else like that. Right now, in between stuff, that's what's there. Yes, I have worked with Black Locus um, in its traditional sense, making um, posts, fence posts and fences with it. Super, super hard stuff, um, but at the same time, a lot of it was green too, so it was a heck of a lot easier. I found the green stuff to be similar to like white oak. Um, still hard though, a lot of, lot of nasty, nasty uh, tear, tear out and grain and a lot of silica in it as well, which is why it's great for fence posts. Yeah, sorry, Bruce. Um, I'm not a big fan of eBay these days either. You gotta, you gotta check out um, the, the, the nicer tool dealers like Hyperkit and Josh Clark has always been really good to me. So many of my antique tools have come from Josh. Um, Superior Toolworks is another good one to look at. And another one, I've mentioned Ernie before, uh, grandpa'slittlefarm.com. Ernie Stevenson, he's, um, full disclosure, he is an apprentice at the Hand Tool School, but he's also one of the nicest guys you will meet. He will go above and beyond to help you out. He's a guy as a resource for auger bits, but he's also incredibly resourceful. If you reach out to Ernie and tell him you're looking for center bits, he'll probably magically start coming up with center bits. So check that out as well, Bruce. Um, I hate to send people to eBay because it is terrible. Um, just make sure I haven't missed anything above this before I move on. Because um, this is a good question. This is from Timber Anu. Um, and unfortunately, I probably have to call it quits from here because this has got to be a shorter one. I just want to see if there's any quick questions before that. What headphones do I use on WoodTalk? Uh, I don't know. They're Rode, Rode headphones that came with the, uh, the microphone. They're not anything special. Um, okay, Timber Anu wants to know, um, do you ever get disheartened when using hand tools? Sometimes wishing you use more power tools. It's a very good question. Honestly, no. Now, no. Um, there were times when, not disheartened, but just kind of like tired. Like crap, I could you know whip this out a heck of a lot faster. Um, but in every instance, it came down to grunt work. It never, I've never felt that way when it comes to joinery because uh, I, I actually firmly believe that I, I'm, I'm just better at joinery by hand than I ever was with power tools. And a lot of that may be, um, I went, I went, I've been working with hand tools 
has it been longer than power tools now i don't know but it's been a while and the change in working method working rhythm is is so transformed me that i would i'm much better with hand tools than i would with power tools kind of like fishing i can't catch a dang thing on a spinning rod but put a fly rod in my hand and i can catch fish all day no idea how to do it the other way because i've been doing fly fishing for so long um where i where the disheartening or the wishing i had a power tool comes from is um, milling sometimes, especially now that I've got a 20 inch planer, um, glue up a wide panel and you're like, man, you know, I could mill this by hand or I could just go flip the switch on that and, you know, call it a, call it a shortcut, but it's never really a disillusionment, um, because of just the way I work and because I've been doing it this way for so long and because I love it so much. Um, I just don't like the noise and the dust. I mean, it sounds trivial, but that's really, um, when I turn that planer on, um, I hate it. it does a great job but man it's actually a lot quieter than like a benchtop planer so yeah it's really not um it's never been a disillusionment for for that much <sighs> favorite woodworking conference so far is woodworking in america um but i have not been to handworks yet i haven't been to the the the, the fine woodworking one fine woodworking live uh <laughs> so maybe maybe by default it's woodworking in america Bruce says he uses Bessies all sizes. Um, is there really a difference between Jet and Bessie anymore? There used to be just in, in how the, the, the actual clamp faces were, were formed, but I don't know if they're any different. Uh, do wood molding plate blades need to be tapered? Yes, they do. Um, if you use an untapered blade, well, need might be, whoops, that was loose. Need might be a bit of a strong word. You can do it without a tapered blade but you'll find that it doesn't hold as well. It's not a good idea to have a camera cable running in front of the door. Um, there's not a, an enormous taper. This is a, a, a Bickford plane. If you look here, you can see it's a little bit thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. It's not a massive one. Um, hey, thank you, DIY Dylan. I think you might be the very first super chat I've ever got. I actually just turned that on a while ago because I didn't know I had to turn it on. So thank you. Um, but what happens is it, it will still slip. That wedging action gives you, it, because it's thicker at the bottom than it is at the top, when the wedge comes in place, it holds it a lot firmer. Where this really comes into play, this is the number 10. It's a relatively medium-sized um, hollow and round. Where it really is important is when you get down to the fours and the twos, like that. That one just slid right out rubber flooring to the rescue because that blade just fell right on the floor this number two super skinny number four also skinny there's just not a lot of surface area on this little blade so adding that taper to it really goes a long way to ensuring that it doesn't slip while you're using it um, there are some instances where you'll find like cheaper made um, vintage hollows and rounds that are not tapered and you'll find that they slip a lot in those smaller sizes okay one more question because i really do need to go i thought i saw one somebody asked me about do i use hollows and rounds to make custom moldings yes i do and in case you were unsur about that Sorry to make everybody seasick. This astrical molding, that is a custom profile done with a hollow and round plane. This classical profile at the bottom, that is a custom molding done with a hollow and round. This profile came out of my head. Um, well, not really. It's kind of a thumbnail profile, but it's an asymmetrical, it's a multi-radius profile, and then there's a single uh, radius on the bottom. Those were all done with hollows and rounds. Um, yeah, uh, I do. I use hollows and rounds exclusively for moldings now because I don't have a router anymore. So yeah, there's the answer to that question. Cool, cool, cool. Well, um, I think that's everything, guys. Uh, I, I really enjoy these things. They're always, so far, there seems to be so, um, so many more questions that I could possibly get to. So uh, you know, I'm going to do another one of these the first Thursday of the month. So in two weeks from today, I'll do another 
uh, Q&A or another live session. I haven't determined if I'm going to do another Q&A or if I'm going to do a specific topic. So if there is something on your mind, let me know. If I find something that I can turn into a, a live demo on a specific topic, I'll do it. If not, I'll just fall back to a Q&A. So um, I do appreciate everybody coming out. I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer everybody's questions. Uh, real quick, Andrew, yes, I will be doing more Lumberyard videos. I just got to um, find the time and frankly, do it when it's not uh, uh, 98 degrees outside. <laughs> All right, cool everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, weekend's coming. Have a good weekend. Get in your shops. We'll see y'all later.